Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. When we look at how we're spending our time, we need to constantly ask ourselves this question. Am I investing in Christ's kingdom in heaven or am I investing in my kingdom on earth? Today, as we study 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to look at Paul's exhortation to the Corinthians to make sure that they're following Jesus and doing his work and investing in his kingdom. So welcome to the Key Chapters podcast. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. This is our daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of the Bible. And today we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, as we turn to chapter 3, Paul is continuing his point that he began all the way back in chapter 1. Back in chapter 1, Paul recognized that there were some issues in the Corinthian church that needed to be dealt with. And his point back in chapter 1 was that their issues were actually spiritual in nature and therefore required spiritually minded people to resolve. And so in chapter 1, Paul called them to be properly oriented to the cross, uh, not to run around these highfalutin views of themselves, but with a humble view of themselves, recognizing that anything they have in Christ has been given to them by God. And then in chapter 2, Paul calls them to have a spiritual mindset, and they need to be surrendered to God and seeking God's wisdom and not seeking the wisdom of man or using the methods of man. And so now we come to chapter 3. In chapter 3, Paul lowers the boom on this church. He says in verse 1, And I, as in continuing everything that Paul has been saying so far, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as the men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. That's got to be a tough message to hear, but Paul's not trying to be harsh with them. He is just letting them know their spiritual situation and what's keeping them from resolving this conflict. You see, the disunity they were having was not because they were all so mature, but rather because they were so immature. They were acting like men of the flesh, thinking in fleshly terms, using fleshly wisdom. They thought they had arrived, but they were really spiritual infants. They had a ton more to go. And so Paul lets them know in verse 2 that as 18 months of them back in Acts chapter 18, all of that specialized time with the apostle Paul himself didn't launch them into a stratosphere of spiritual wisdom. Paul was just laying down the basics with them. And so in verse 2, Paul says, I gave you, as in past tense, because he's talking about when he was with him in Acts 18, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able to receive it, for, going on to verse 3, you are still fleshly. And so they're really not ready to receive what he's about to tell them, but the problem is they've got so many issues, he's got to say what he's got to say, and he's letting them know, guys, this is going to be tough for you to hear Hopefully you're prayed on up because it's going to take the Holy Spirit to help you receive what I've got to say. And so in verse 3, Paul starts to address the issues they're facing. First up, don't follow men, follow Jesus. And so Paul says in verses 3 and 4, For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, another, I'm of Apollos, are you not mere men? In other words, you guys aren't acting nearly as great as you think you are. This whole thing about which teacher you're going to follow. I'm not going to follow Paul. I'm not going to follow Paulus. That just shows you guys aren't getting it. You're still following people. Uh, You're still thinking this is the guy you like or that's the guy you like. And you're not realizing that these men are just servants of Jesus and you're supposed to be following Jesus. And so all of this focus on teachers, it may actually be pointed to the fact that you're actually not following Jesus. And so Paul tries to give them some perspective in verses 5 to 7. He says, What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Verse 6 says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. So it's not about teachers. It's not like thinking like the world does about their favorite heroes, their favorite athletes, their favorite celebrities. What really matters is, is the Lord and what he's doing in them and through them. And then in verse 8, Paul points them to the day when they'll stand before God. And on that day, it will be crystal clear who was being used by God. And so he says in verse 8, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to their labor. And so here we have an interesting thing. Paul is talking about rewards. Now, we tend to get uncomfortable talking about rewards because we say that salvation is all of grace, not of our works, and that's true. 
But the reality is that a person who is truly born again, who has died to their old life and begun to live a new life in Christ, who has received a new orientation and a new purpose and a new will, they will serve Christ because he is their God and King. And now that they're serving Christ, he will be faithful to reward their service. Now, we're going to come back to this principle in a couple of verses, but in our passage right here in verses 9 to 10, Paul is still focusing on how these teachers are just servants of Christ, and they are teaching the people to walk with Jesus so that he would be their Lord and God and King. Apollos isn't looking for a gathering. Paul's not looking for a gathering. They're just trying to point all these people to walk with Christ. And so in verse 9, Paul says, for we are God's fellow workers. We're like, we work together, guys. We're both on the same team. You're God's field. You're God's building. Guys, God is doing this work among you. The church that's going on with you guys, that's not Paul's church. It's not my church. It's God's church. It's Jesus's church. And any spiritual harvest that's actually going on, that's the work of God among you. And so any work that Paul did was still just being done by God, for God, through God, under his watchful care. And so he says in verse 10, According to the grace of God, which was given to me, as in God gave me the grace, guys, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. Hey, let's celebrate that Apollos is working among you. Great. It's still the work of God. But each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And so Paul laid the foundation, yes, but it was really just pointing them to the foundation that was really laid by God, which is Jesus. And then he shows them how to build on this foundation and they just need to follow his example, whether it's Apollos or somebody else, just make sure everything you're doing is built on Christ. Now, when Paul talks about building on Christ in verse 11, what does he mean by that? Well, this goes back to the message of the apostles that we saw throughout the book of Acts and the book of Romans. What was the message of the apostles? Well, that Jesus is the prophesied messianic king that he died and rose again to be our savior, that he will return to establish a kingdom. And if we want a place in his kingdom and a relationship with him, we must be made righteous. And we can't be made righteous by our own deeds. It has to be given to us by God through Jesus Christ by faith. This is the foundation that we must build upon. And if we're not building on this foundation, we're going to find out that our work will not endure the fires of God's judgment. And that brings us then to an important section of scripture here in verses 12 to 15. In verse 12, Paul says, Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. And so Paul is telling us here that there will be a day we will stand before the Lord and he will test the quality of the work that we have built upon the foundation of Christ. Verse 14 goes on to say, if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. And so our work will be tested by fire and the work that God did through us. And Paul refers to that work in verses six and seven as the growth that God causes. That's the work that will endure and receive a reward. But it has to be built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And this is specifically reminding us here that what we're doing needs to be done in the midst of the church because that's where Christ is working He works in and through his people, in and through his body. Now, there's a lot of good things that people do in this world, but those works here, they're not even making it to this point because it's not on the foundation of Jesus. The works that endure through eternity are the eternal works that God does in us and through us as we build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul recognizes that this is going to cause some concern. That's why he's trying to wake us up here. And so he says in verse 15, he's talking about this person who's not building into the work of Christ, who's not been serving the Lord, not seeking to be used by God. And this person, he wants to understand now that their eternity is going to be impacted by this indifference to the work of God. And so in verse 15, Paul says, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. And so this person who's truly born again will be saved, but they're going to find on out that they were investing in churches that really weren't being built on the foundation of Christ or or the work that they were doing. It wasn't the work of God. They were just doing their own thing. And this is just a solemn, sober reminder here that all of us need to be sure that we're plugged into a good church and doing our part in building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. That is the work that God does through us. And that is the work that God rewards. Well, let's keep going through this chapter here because verses 16 and 17 bring us back to the kind of mindset we need to have with one another when it comes to all of these disagreements. 
Remember, all of this stuff about our work is really in the context of people arguing about which teacher they should follow. And Paul's point is they should follow God and be about his work and his name and not doing work in the name of anyone else besides the Lord. And so in verses 16 and 17, the Lord says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Now, when I quit smoking about 30 years ago, someone showed me this passage as an example of why I need to take care of the temple of God within me. Now, I think that's a fine point to make in a general sense. Our bodies are a gift from God, and we need to be good stewards of them. However, that's not the point that Paul's making here. In the overall context, it goes back to chapter 1. Paul is addressing the disunity within this church and the factions that are arising over which person follows which teacher. No doubt harsh words were being said in the midst of this turmoil. No doubt the church was being hurt. No doubt people were being hurt. And Paul's point here is we dare not speak ill of another brother or sister in Christ. We dare not harm the work of God among the church. The Spirit of God dwells within us. We are the temples of His glory. Do not seek to destroy or belittle or harm a fellow brother or sister in the Lord because God dwells in them. They are a walking temple to God. The church is the place where God dwells. And when we harm one another, we are harming those very people God loves and we will face judgment in our life for it. Now you can see this principle in the following set of verses where Paul says, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise, as in truly wise. The person who is running around, cutting down the church, hurting folks because they don't have this wisdom or this knowledge this one person has, that person who can flagrantly hurt the church of God needs to do some serious soul searching and heart surgery. That person who thought they were so wise, that person's going to have to become foolish. Foolish as in the world's way is to have the wisdom of God. He must give up his worldly thinking. And if he won't, he won't become wise, not biblically wise, not righteously wise. And so this is just showing us here, when we cling to our worldly notions of how to determine truth and what is wisdom, those very things that we cling to will keep us from knowing God's true wisdom. Now, Paul continues this thought for the next few verses, and then he gives a final summary of verse 21. He says, so then, let no one boast in men, as in, stop boasting in people, just focus on Jesus and the work he is doing in you. And then, having laid down this heavy message, we see that Paul has not lost hope in this church because then in verses 21 to 23, Paul ends this chapter on a super high note. He says, For all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. In other words, look, guys, you have everything you need. It's all yours. God will give it to you. You belong to Christ. And if you're about his work in this world, you will have everything you need. You're Christ's people. Christ is God's son. And God will lovingly give the citizens of his son's kingdom all that they need to engage in kingdom work that will last for eternity. You've got it all. So now go forward in faith, in spiritual faith, doing the work that God has called you to do. And so that's chapter three. This chapter gives us some important questions for us to consider. First question is, we need to heed Paul's warning about not becoming too attached to any Bible teacher. Every true servant of Christ will want to point all of us back to Jesus. They won't want us following them. They will want us following the Lord and walking with him. Now, along those lines, there's a tendency to elevate celebrity Christians in our day. We need to be on guard about becoming too dazzled by any specific teacher. Most of all, we should be astounded by our glorious King and part of our growing in worship of God is serving him and being amazed at the work that he does in us and through us. And so we also need to take Paul's warning seriously here about one day giving an account for our lives. If we're followers of Christ, this account is not about salvation. That issue, that question was settled on the cross, but there will be an examination of what we bring into heaven, kind of like a glorified border checkpoint. And we're only going to be bringing into heaven those things which Jesus did in us and through us. Nothing that we produce on our own will gain entrance into God's kingdom because by definition, his kingdom is to replace all the messed up ways of man of this world. God doesn't want things of this world in his kingdom. And so on that day, there'll be many people who will be shocked to find out that the quality of their work was in fact wood, hay, and straw, and it will burn in the fires of God's judgment. And so as we finish out our time today, how about spending some time with the Lord in prayer, asking that he would be working in you and through you 
so that the harvest of your life is a harvest that will count for eternity. Well, we'll leave things there. Thanks for listening and have a great day. God bless.